All right, so uh, this is the voluntary just problem solving. So we're emphasizing problem solving. I'm going to try and record the lecture to help those that can't be here, as well as to help you if you want to review sections of it. But the emphasis is problem solving, true? And since it's only still the first week, I haven't hit a stride to get into a, deep, a pattern, but we're trying here. So let's just jump into it. Is, uh, this is our equation. We're going to use it in a minute to apply to solve a problem. So this equation is our exergy balance equation. It has terms that have meaning, the exergy change, the amount of exergy that's transferred with heat, and if the heat is transferred into the system, it brings with it some exergy. What's in parentheses right here is 1 minus T naught, a low temperature, divided by TB, the boundary, or higher temperature. It's easiest to think that. When you see that 1 minus T over T, what do you think of? Carnot. Carnot efficiency of a heat engine. And really what Carnot efficiency was, was what percentage, that's the fraction, that's the percentage, that's the efficiency in that, percent, in that, in that bracket right there. What percentage of that heat transfer can be theoretically converted to work? And so that's all we're doing, really. There's a Carnot efficiency. Then we have the exergy transfer with the work right here. And notice it's this work, which is the boundary work, if there's any shaft work, if there's any electrical work cutting across that boundary of the system, minus or subtracting the non-useful component, which is pushing back the boundary. True? Pushing back the environment. Then we also have exergy destruction, that term. Exergy destruction is zero if sigma is zero. What is sigma? What is this sigma? It's entropy generation. So the same reason that you have entropy generation, irreversibilities, is the same reason you have exergy destruction. So exergy gets destroyed when there are irreversibilities, entropy is generated when there are irreversibilities. And the change in this property, exergy, is given by this long equation. Many times the change in potential and kinetic are negligible. And so often it just boils down to evaluation of these terms, which are just properties. Let's solve a problem. So let's solve this problem. A paddle wheel is used to stir 2 kilograms of water initially at 200 degrees C and 50% quality until the pressure is 20 bar. So think of a container with a paddle wheel coming across and the paddle wheel beats and churns up that water that's inside. Continuing to read, the water is contained in a rigid tank. So this tank doesn't expand like a balloon, it's rigid. There is no heat transfer from the water, and the effects of motion and gravity can be neglected. The dead state temperature and the dead state pressure are given. So for the steam as the system, determine a couple things. What is the final quality of the steam? So we think about the initial state 1 and the final state 2. The initial state, just to help categorize or put information down that's given in the problem statement, is at a temperature of 200 degrees C and a quality of 50 percent. The state 2, we don't know the temperature, but we know the final pressure is 20 bar. And we don't know the quality. We're asked to find the quality x at state 2, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause, and I want you to organize your thoughts and not numerically give me the value of quality, what you're asked to solve for, for part A, but show me how you would do it, okay? Okay, this is what I recommend. You make a list of all the properties you know anything about. Almost just put the list down from memory. You wanna talk about thermo? Give me some properties in thermo. How about temperature, quality, pressure, uh, specific volume, internal energy, enthalpy, entropy. Okay? 
those, that's a pretty good list, and sometimes the list goes a little longer, but that's a pretty good list. And now you say to yourself, over here, pressure, temperature at 2, quality at 2, specific volume at 2, internal energy at 2, enthalpy at 2, entropy at 2. These are all at 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And those two up here, T1 and X1, really fix the state. Could I not get uh, P1? How would I get P1? It's, that's equal to P sat at T1. And I can look in the book and I say, okay, the steam table, 200 degrees C, the saturation pressure is 15.5, if I wanted to put a number to it, bar. See, that's what I'm thinking. I got two independent intensive properties. The temperature and the quality allow me to find other properties. How would I find V1 if I wanted to find V1? What type of equation would I use? Would I use the equation that it's V sub F plus the quality at 1 times V sub G minus V sub F? Yeah, that's right. How about if I wanted internal energy at 1? Is it U sub F plus the quality at 1? U sub G, that looks like a V sub G. U sub G minus U sub F? And the same with H and the same with S. So let's put S of F plus quality 1, S of G minus S of F. Okay. I just showed you how we use two properties to get the other properties for state one. But I need to know another property for state two. Hey, you're not in the class and you already passed it. <laughs> I can. Oh, you're going to ask? Go ahead. Well, if I beat this with the egg beater, do you think the temperature will stay the same, even though the pressure went from 15.4 bar to 20 bar? Is it true that you put quality um, When we beat this, was there some liquid on the bottom and some vapor on the top? Is that what this looks like? A system with some, and by mass, not by volume, by mass, how much of it, what percentage of it is liquid and what percentage is vapor by mass? 50% by mass. Not by volume, because the liquid is so dense, it's much smaller volume contained in the bottom. And most of the volume is vapor to have 50% by mass. So when we beat it, you could beat it so rigorously and so long that it could all turn to vapor. But it's probably still some liquid and some vapor. True? Okay, uh, but what property, what property over on this list under two, state two, can you determine or can you work to get so that it now fixes the state and then you can get the other properties? The specific volume. And why the specific volume? Because of this word in the problem statement, it's a rigid tank. What does a rigid tank mean? Like a balloon, it's going to blow up and get smaller and bigger? No, no, no. Fixed volume. There's no mass coming in or out. So the total volume is fixed. The total mass is fixed. The specific volume is constant. Now, it's not isobaric. That's constant pressure. It's not isothermal. I'm giving you a little improvement on our vocabulary, right? Not isothermal. It's not isentropic. It's iso Coric, something like that, isochoric. We don't use that word often, but it's constant volume. So this is V1 is equal to V2. This and this fix the state. How would I find? How would I find the other properties at state 2 if I need them? Well, it asked me to calculate the final quality of the steam, X2. What is X2? Is it V sub 1 minus V sub F divided by V sub G minus V sub F? Is that, is that what it is? Sure. And so you, now you can f find X2. And that's how you find the answer. I'm just going to mark it over here. The answer to part A. All right. So now we know X2. 
you can go and get U2, H2, S2, and even T2. What is T2? What you're going to find is this definitely is in the two-phase region. You find that the quality at state two using this approach is about, let me look at this number here. It's uh, right at 0 0.6409. What happens if my math showed me it was 1.2, 120% quality? What would you do? It would be completely vapor. Abandon that approach. Do not use quality in the superheated region. And now you just have to march off to the superheated tables and find the state knowing V2 and P2, but you don't need to get X2. There's no quality in a superheated region. True? All right. So now, using that quality at state 2, you can get these other properties, U2, H2, S2, T2. Let's take a look now for part B. What is the work transfer during that process? So we're interested in calculating the work from initial state one to final state two. One is our notation for initial state, and two is our notation for final state. True? Uh, I'm gonna want, I want you to give me the equation to calculate work one to two. All right, so we use the first law. So for the process, the first law is that the change in the internal energy neglecting changes in kinetic and potential is equal to how much heat was transferred in minus the work out of what system? The system which consists of the steam or water, whatever you want to call it. Okay, that's our system. So it's no heat transfer, true. And so now you find that the work, 1 to 2, is equal to just the mass times the um, lowercase uh, U1 minus U2. Uh, I took care of that negative sign. You come over here, you have to evaluate U1. You evaluate U2 by doing U sub F plus X2, U sub G minus U sub F. A little work to get those, those internal energies, U. And you calculate the work, 1 to 2, is equal to negative 538 kilojoules. We stop for a minute. You say, it's negative. What does that mean? The paddle wheel is putting work into the system, not out. We are staying with our traditional sign convention that positive work is out of our system. All right. Extra G transfer accompanying the work. So now you're starting to think about extra G transfer. So how much exergy is transferred with that work where there's negative 538 kilojoules being transferred to work, meaning the direction is into the system, not out? What symbol are we asked to solve for? We're asked to solve for EW, just like W1 to 2. You could put, the sim you could put W1 to 2 like that, but nobody really does. It's EW for the process. Like a lot of times people won't put the 1 to 2 there, they just put W for the process. Okay? So how do you calculate that? I'm going to pause and come around. So what it is is when you have a work transfer, it's already in that most valued form of energy, work. Remember, exergy was what is the amount of energy that can be converted into useful work? Well, work is already in that form, so it's 100% one-to-one. Heat is not. That's why you had that 1 minus T naught over Tb in front of the heat transfer. So it's a fraction less than 1. So the exergy transfer with the work is negative 538 kilojoules, meaning that it's 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 a uh, it's the same direction as the work, meaning that the exergy is being transferred into the system, not out. Okay. Now the last one. What's the exergy destruction? How would you count? First of all, what what is our symbol? We want E sub d. It's the exergy destruction during that process. How do I solve for E sub d? 
two, two methods that you think about. You either know that if I do a second law and get the entropy production, I multiply that by T naught, I have E sub D. The second way is to write an exergy balance equation. Both, if done correctly, will get the same answer. So either you do it using that it's equal to T naught entropy generation, or you use an exergy balance equation. Let's look at the exergy balance equation. So here is our exergy balance equation. It looks like the final exergy minus the initial exergy. So that's the exergy change of the system. It could go up, it could go down. It could be zero. It's equal to the exergy transferred in with the heat. We have no heat transfer. That's why I'm not going to spend no time on that one. You have no heat transfer. There's no exergy transfer with heat if there's no heat transfer. True? But we have minus the exergy transfer with the work. Why do I have a minus in front of that sign? Because work is positive out. And if there's an exergy transfer with that work being in the same direction, it would be positive out, meaning it would de reduce or subtract from the exergy stored. Then we also have a minus the exergy destruction. Does that equation look good for an exergy balance? So what we do is we say, if I want to calculate the exergy destruction, all I need to do is calculate the change in the exergy. I'm going to leave it like that and put a minus sign on it. Minus the exergy transfer with the work. Okay, so how do I calculate the exergy change? Is that going to be the mass times U2 minus U1 plus P0 V2 minus V1 minus T0 S2 minus S1? Is that, is that what it looks like for the exergy change? Thumbs up if you agree. So we look for groups of terms to be zero. This term is that difference of use is not zero. But is this one zero? Why is that that middle group of terms zero? Because it's a rigid tank and the specific volumes are the same. Okay, but what we have to do is we have to get our U2 and U1. We have to get our S2 and our S1 and stick it into this equation, and E2 minus E1 is a positive 203.7 kilojoules. Before we go on, let's take a look at this number. It's a positive quantity. The steam now has more potential to do useful work. It's at a better capacity or improved state in which to do work because at the end of this process, the exergy of the system went up by 200 and about 4 kilojoules. True? Okay. That makes sense because it's higher pressure and warmer, hotter, right? And higher, higher quality. Now what we do is we go ahead and we say in here, we'll say this minus E sub W is a minus negative 538. You can almost read these equations. That means there was really a 538 kilojoules of transfer of exergy coming into the system with work. And if somehow all of it would have been converted into, uh, well, first of all, some of it was converted into exergy storage. How much? 200 and about 4 kilojoules, see? So the exergy that's destroyed, I know it's a little hard dealing with these minus signs, is 334 kilojoules. Our answer is positive, just chase the negative signs, and it's 334 kilojoules, which means 538 came in, 334 were destroyed, and 204, roughly, are available for a clever engineer to exploit, to now take that system toward the dead state and make work. That help? 
Be because um, that's, that's, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know how to, it's what is the definition of our exergy? Uh, and if you go back to this equation, we have no expansion, it's rigid tank. So our exergy transfer with the work is simply the work. It's 100%. Uh, if you have, right, if you don't have a rigid tank and you have a change in the volume and it, and it expands against the atmospheric pressure or dead state pressure, you have to take that off. That's why you have the negative sign in here. Yeah, right. Got it? All right. Now, uh, you take this. I'm just going to give you a Cliff Notes version on some of these derivations because we want to get to open systems. And uh, you take the closed system, and instead of having it for a finite difference, you do it for a small difference, an infinitesimally small difference. So that'll be 1 minus T naught over TB del Q minus del W minus P naught DV minus T naught del sigma. So a small amount of entropy generation, a small volume change, a small amount of work transfer, a small amount of heat transfer, and a small change in exergy of the system. You then take and divide each term by the time, a small change in time, small change in time, small change in time, small change in time, and now you get a rate, a balance equation. So we have the rate at which the exergy changes in our closed system, is equal to the rate at which it flows in with the heat, the rate at which it flows out with the power or work, and if you need to have some, if it's expanding with time, we have to take off that non-useful component of boundary work, and then the rate at which exergy is being destroyed. Now this equation we don't use very often, but it's our launching point for the control volume. So. If you come here, we modify that rate equation for the closed system, and the textbook doesn't give a formal derivation or modification. It just says, look, it's, it's very similar to what we did in, in the previous chapters when we did uh, from, for an energy balance. And so what happens is, is you say, we're going to do an exergy rate balance equation for a now an open system, a control volume, Almost all of our problems are steady state, so forget that term. It's steady state. So everything on the left-hand side is zero. And what you have is you have the exergy transferring in with the heat. We now, if you have steady state, it can't continue to expand. So dVdt is zero. You know, it, it, your control volume doesn't continue to expand or, or contract. And so this term, just as W dot CV, they emphasize this is out of the control volume. And we just throw in these two parameters. What are they? This is the exergy transfer with the mass coming in and the exergy transfer with the mass going out. That's why they have a minus sign in front of it. I for in, E for exit, and then you still have that rate of exergy destruction right there. So now, instead of having the exergy just lowercase e as if it's a closed system, you have the flow exergy, and this is the definition of the flow exergy. Hey, there's our friend the enthalpy. Doesn't it look familiar? And so here is our steady state exergy balance equation for an open system, and you have the flow exergy in front of, and multiplying the mass flow rates. Um, often there's no sum term here, so get rid of that. Often one inlet, one outlet, and it's operating at steady state, so the m dot is just one m dot, and then you just have the difference in the flow exergies. This is very, very common. And the difference in the flow exergies, difference in enthalpy minus T naught, difference in entropies, blah. True. This, this equation right here is the one we use again and again for control volume analysis. Why does it have what? Well, because exergy is a combination of first law concepts as well as second law. Second law limits the transfer of energy between forms, and this reflects that limitation, so it has entropy in it. 
but it's primarily an energy balance. But it's the useful energy balance, knowing that some of the useful energy can be turned into unuseful energy, if that makes sense. So it can be lost. Some of the useful energy can be lost. Like They call it lost work potential, things like that. Here's a problem. Let's solve this one. Air enters a nozzle. Okay, a little review of a nozzle. We have a larger cross-sectional area to a smaller cross-sectional area. It comes in at state one, flowing in that direction. It goes out at state two, flowing in that direction. It's just one directional for the flow. It's air. When you see air, what do you think of? Ideal gas. It uh, comes in at a temperature one of 700 Kelvin and a pressure one of 420 kPa. It goes out at a, uh, also velocity one, uh, 90 meters per second. The pressure at two is, uh, no, the temperature at two. The temperature at two is 590 Kelvin, and the pressure at two is 220 kilopascal. Look at those numbers. Temperature goes down, Pressure goes down. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it makes sense. Stray heat transfer can be neglected. So Q dot's equal to zero. There's no shaft work, so that's equal to W dot as well. The nozzle doesn't have any shaft work in or out. And uh, you want to model it as an ideal gas with constant specific heat using this value for C sub P. So we want to use that value of specific heat, and we don't need to go to the air tables. Use a constant specific heat. Okay, calculate the velocity at the exit. All right, I'll go ahead and pause for a second. You write down how you're going to calculate the velocity at the exit of the nozzle. So what you want to do is you want to introduce a control volume like this. Where does the mass flow cut across the control volume? At one and at two and no other place. There's no heat transfer or work transfer across that control volume. You could do conservation of mass. You could do conservation of energy. You could do exergy balance, entropy balance. There's four things you can do with a control volume. Mass, energy, entropy, exergy, right? Mass is trivial. M dot in equal to M dot out, steady state. Energy is what we really need to get to velocity. So when we do the energy balance, we're going to say, okay, steady state, Q dot, oh, that's zero, minus W dot, oh, that's zero. M dot, it's in times H1 minus H2 plus Ke1 minus Ke2. Look familiar? Neglecting changes in potential energy. The M dots even cancel. So what we have is we have that the kinetic energy outlet is equal to the kinetic energy inlet plus H1 minus H2. Okay, I want to use constant specific heats for air. Can, how can I calculate the change in an enthalpy assuming constant specific heat for air? And so let's just go ahead. That kinetic energy is 1 half V2 squared. This specific kinetic energy is one half v1 squared, and so what we find is that the exit speed v2 is equal to v1 squared plus two c sub p t1 minus t2 all square rooted. Did I make an algebraic error? Or a thumbs up. Look good. Okay, so now. I warn you, units, 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 units. So when we continue this problem, we'll put in 90 meters per second and we'll square it. What are the units on that term? Meters squared per second squared. And when you take the square root of it, you'll get meters per second. Perfect. But that's the other one. We have two times unit 1.051 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin times the temperature change, it comes in at 5, oops, 700, and it goes out at 590 Kelvin. 
So the Kelvins cancel, that's good, but I have this kilojoule per kilogram. A lot of students will throw out the units and let's just proceed. Right? That's just, no, no, no. You have to remember that there is 1,000 meters squared per second squared is equal to 1 kilojoule per kilogram. So the kilojoules per kilogram cancel. Okay, they cancel. And we have that 1,000. Then you take the square root. And now you can get the right answer. So V2, 489 meters per second. Now, what is the answer for part B? What is the rate of exergy destruction? We're looking for, look at the units on this. Are we looking for E dot D or are we looking for E dot D divided by M dot? Which one are we looking for? The second one, E dot D divided by M dot. That you can tell by the units. They, they, they want the units in kilojoules per kilogram. How do we solve for this term? Two ways to do it. You either get entropy generation or do an exergy balance. Okay? So let's uh, flip a coin. Which one do you want to do? Exergy balance? That's the hard way. Yeah. Let's do it both ways and we'll see. If they're consistent, you'll get the right one. But let's do it this way. What you have to do for it's a. Uh, uh, the exergy balance, E X B A L. Okay, steady state. There's no uh, transfer with the Q. Uh, so maybe I should put E Q and then strike that out, zero. And there's no exergy transfer with the work because there's no work, no heat, no work. There's no none of that, true? And then we're going to have uh, plus the mass flow rate. E F in minus E F out, true, minus E dot D, true? Did I write the exergy balance equation correctly? Thumbs up if you agree. Good. So E dot D divided by M dot, what we're asked to calculate, is going to be the difference in the flow exergy out. Uh, no, it's flow exergy in, sorry minus the flow exergy out, which is equal to H1 minus H2 minus T naught S1 minus S2. True? Okay. If you want, you put C sub P T1 minus T2 minus T naught. How about this S? C sub P natural log of T1 over T2 minus R natural log of P1 over P2. You have to know how to be able to calculate the change in entropy of an ideal gas when you have constant specific heats. Okay? So there you go on that. So this is E dot D divided by M dot. Okay. Um, um, okay, um, I left off a term, right? What term did I leave off? I left off that you have the kinetic energy 1 minus the kinetic energy 2. Sorry about that. True? And so if I have, actually, it's even simpler now because... Um, what do I have right here? I have that H1 minus H2 plus Ke1 minus Ke2 is equal to what? Zero. H1 minus H2 plus Ke1 minus Ke2 is equal to zero from the first law. So this is all that remains out of the exergy balance equation. True? Okay. 
If you do this, if you say, I want to calculate it by first calculating sigma dot divided by m dot, I'll have to calculate sigma dot divided by m dot by an entropy balance. When I calculate the entropy balance, it'll be equal to S2 minus S1. True? Okay, when you do that, now if I want to calculate the exergy destruction per unit mass, you take that T naught multiplied by sigma dot divided by M dot. Hey, we just found that to be S2 minus S1. Oh, but I have a minus sign, right? Minus sign. So that minus sign allows me to switch S1 minus S2. Actually, forget it. I'm sorry. I got to get this right here. It's equal to T naught times sigma dot divided by M dot. That's true. It's equal to T naught times S2 minus S1. That's true. Is equal to minus T naught S1 minus S2 because that's precisely what we wrote right there. They're the same exact thing. Okay. Um, let me give you an answer for the rate of exergy destruction. And the answer is going to be 1.73 kilojoules per kilogram. E dot D divided by M dot. 